we're in Deuteronomy, and Moses is giving his last will and testament to the Jewish people. He's been speaking now his monologue about five weeks or so before his passing. This is the third part in a row that it's the uninterrupted monologue of Moses. It began with somewhat of a retrospective on the history of the 40 years of the Jewish people since the Exodus up to that point. And then it began looking forward. And as we advance throughout the book, it's looking more and more forward. Moses is guiding the nation with respect to what they should do, what they should be aware of, what are the concerns, what are the dangers facing them once they enter the land. And he tells us a very provocative verse, a verse where the questions are immediately apparent, the contradictions are glaring, and the consequences of this verse are are very powerful for us. We're going to read the verse, and we're going to try to see what lessons they contain. Va'ata Yisrael, and now, O Israel, Ma Hashem Elokecha Shoel Mi'imach. What does Hashem, your God, want of you? If we just had that, like, is there any more provocative, evocative, intriguing, beginning preamble of a verse. And we've been now through four and a half books of the Torah. And we've gone through all kinds of narratives and all kinds of stories and all kinds of laws. And now Moses says, okay, we're going to distill it all. What does the Almighty actually want from us? What a way to get our attention. And the answer doesn't seem to really answer the question. And that's why it gets really interesting. What does God really want from us? What's the bottom line? What's the the distilled desire of God? What does God actually want? You have all kinds of mitzvahs, all kinds of instructions, all kinds of ordinances, all kinds of laws, all kinds of guidance. But what's the bottom line? And then he gives us the answer. Tim, only. Wow, this is, we're going to simplify, right? Only. Liyira et Hashem To fear Hashem your God. Lalechet bechol drachav to go in all his ways, ula ahavoto and to love him, ula avod Hashem lorkecha and to worship Hashem your God bechol avavcha or bechol nafshecha with all your hearts and with all your soul. You ask for it. Here's the answer. What does God really want from you? Everything, <laughs> love of God and fear of God and worshiping God with all your hearts, with all your soul, walking in all the ways of God. This is it. Everything else is commentary. That's what Moses seems to be telling us. What does God really want? Let's simplify. Give me the abstract. Give me the bottom line. What's the bottom line of Torah? It's everything. It's love of God. It's fear of God. It's going in God's ways. It is everything, really. Worshiping him with all our heart, with all our soul. And by the way, the very next verse says doing all the mitzvos, all that, that as well. What is going on with this verse? We're given the promise of the distilled version of all Torah. Let's boil it all down to one verse, to one idea. And then we get four or five ideas that are so comprehensive and almost are towering over all of Torah, seem very hard for us to do. And that's really, that's it. That's all God really wants from us. So the question really is unusual. And the answer is even more perplexing. You know, the whole notion of trying to distill Torah, if you could shorten something, by definition, certainly the way the Talmud sees the Torah, if any word or any idea or any theme or any concept or even any letter could have been omitted, it would have been omitted. So the whole question assumes that, or at least the way we understand the question, it assumes that, well, there's a lot of details, but what's the bottom line? What's the real message that we're supposed to take away? But isn't the answer really everything? If there was something superfluous, it would not have been included. So the question is a little bit odd. And the answer is even more perplexing because we've been promised what God really wants from us. And we're giving a very long answer, four different things. Each one of them maybe is a lifetime's work. And it doesn't seem to be as easy as the verse leads us on to believe. So what I want to do today is I want to suggest, or really I want to present, three different approaches to understanding this verse. Uh, Two of them from the Talmud. The Talmud deduces this verse in two different ways, in two different books of Talmud. And the third is, 
uh, essentially from one of the commentators of the Talmud, and I um, adapted it a little bit uh, in my own way. But it's 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 one of the commentaries on 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 the Torah. It gives us a, a third approach, uh, which I think can also be a very uh, valuable takeaway to understand this verse and what what it uh, what it means for our religious life and our spiritual life and our connection to God. So the first approach is found in the book of Brachos. The book of Brachos, of course, is the first book of the Talmud. It's on page 33b. And it begins with an introduction. And this seems to be exactly what the message of, of the verse is. It says, Amar Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Hanina says, Rabbi Hanina is one of the sages of the Talmud, Hakol bide shamayim, everything is in the hands of heaven, with the exception of fear of heaven. And it quotes our verse. Well, what's the source that everything is in the hands of heaven, besides the fear of heaven? The source is, and now, O Israel, what does Hashem want from you? To fear Him. That's the only thing that He wants of you, because everything else He's taking care of. So this is, you know, if the, if the verse was provocative, then the Talmud's explication of it is maybe even more provocative. What it's telling us is, much of life, almost all of life, is predetermined. It's in God's hands. Everything is in the hands of heaven. There's only one variable. There's only one lever that we have, and that is fear of heaven. Everything is in the hands of heaven, with the exception of fear of heaven. That's in our hands. What does that mean? Rashi tells us that everything that happens to us, all the circumstances that we find ourselves in, that is all orchestrated by the Almighty. And he gives some interesting examples. How tall someone is or how short they are. Not something you could really manipulate. It's not in your hands. It's in the hands of heaven. How rich you are, how poor you are. It's not in your hands. It's in the hands of heaven. And as an aside, I will point out that the Talmud of the book of Nida, page uh, 70, I believe it is, it says, well, how do you become rich? Seems to be in conflict. The commentaries say, wait a minute. If it's predetermined by God how rich you are, you can't give me any advice to manipulate that. It's not in our hands. It's in God's hands. That's a separate question, maybe for a different time. In the event that I get invited back, maybe you'll remember to talk about that. Whether you're rich, whether you are poor, says the verse, it says, it says Rashi in explaining this Talmud, is in the hands of God. It's not in your hands. How smart you are, your intellectual capacity. Are you smart? Are you a fool? In the hands of God. Your color complexion. Ain't that interesting? Rashi is telling us, again, the list of things that he is delineating here that are in the hands of heaven. It's the color of your skin. Are you white? Are you black? It's in God's hand. It's not in your hand. All that's in the hands of God. However, whether you are a tzaddik, you're righteous, or you are a rasha, or you are wicked, it's not in the hands of heaven. Rather, that God delivered to us. We have the choice. It's in our hands. And he gave us two ways, two paths to choose. Do we want this path? Do we want that path? Do we want life? Do we want death? We have to choose and we are urged, we are coached, we are encouraged to choose fear of heaven. It's like in a very provocative statement in the Talmud that there's really only one thing that we have. Our free will is in one band. The, the band is only fear of heaven or the opposite. That's it. And therefore the message that Moses is conveying here he really is cutting off the verse at the beginning, right? What does God want from us? To fear heaven. That's it. And the rest of the stuff, maybe that's, uh, th- th- those are uh, appended to uh, to the actual idea, but it's just fear of heaven. And even those things, maybe they're included in fear of heaven. That's what the Talmud says. And then the Talmud asks the question, is fear of heaven really something which is so easy? It seems like it's really hard. Is it easy? Is it hard? The verse seems to imply, what does God really want from us? And the answer seems to be something really easy. And then it says, fear of heaven. And now we find out that that's the only thing that's in our hands. That's the only lever that we have to to manipulate. And it seems to imply that's very easy. But we know it's very hard. It's so difficult to have fear of heaven. Of course, God is invisible. Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos, page 10, A, he's invisible. We can't see him. He can see us. We can't see him. And therefore, all these doubts and all these crises of faith can exist. The world around us, which according to our philosophy, it's distractions, it's the test, 
It's the challenge. It's the maelstrom in which we are placed that causes all that confusion. In fact, the Hebrew word for world is olam, which is the same word for distortion or illusion. Interesting. We're put into a world where God is masked. God is hidden. God is beneath the surface, behind the facade. And yes, we can sense him. Yes, we can connect to him. But we don't have that same visceral or visual or tangible or palpable connection as we do with the world around us. It seems like it's really hard to be fearful of God. It's much easier to be fearful of other people. And in fact, when Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai, the great sage and leader of the Jewish people, was on his deathbed, the Talmud tells us that his students came and there's a whole long story what happened beforehand, which is fascinating in its own right. But they said to him, give us a blessing. And he gave them a blessing. And the blessing was, you should fear God as much as you fear man. How much do you fear God? As much as you fear man. And they said to him, really? That's a blessing? What kind of blessing is that? We should fear God a lot more than we fear man. He says to them, no, 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 no. What happens when someone's about to sin? They look to, they look fro. They look up. They look down. They make sure there's no surveillance cameras. And they sin. People, but anytime someone does a sin, it's almost evidence that they fear man more than they fear God. And therefore, it's a great blessing to make the idea of God as real, as tangible, as visceral, as fearful, as serious as the relationship that we have with other people, as the reality that we accord to other people. So again, it seems like it's a great blessing to say, have, you'll have fear of heaven. If, in fact, Rabbi Yochum Zaki, the leader of the Jewish people, in the end of the first century of the Common Era, that was the blessing that he gave to his students. It made sense that he gave them this blessing because this is everything. Everything is in the hands of heaven besides for fear of it. This is the only thing that matters. But it seems like it's a really hard thing to have fear of heaven, even on the degree where it equals, where it parallels, where it is on par with the fear of humans, that is a great blessing. And here the Talmud says, yeah. It's, or the verse says, the way the Talmud understands the verse is that it's, it's, what does God really want? It's, it's so easy. It's a cinch. It's not so hard at all. Fear of heaven. That's it. It seems like it's easy. So what's the answer? Is fear of heaven easy? Is fear of heaven really hard? It seems like from the verse it's really easy. It seems like from all the other sources that we know that it's the only thing that matters. That it's the great blessing that Rabbi Yochum Zakai accorded to his students. Seems like it's really hard. Which one is it? Says the Talmud. Yes. Who's speaking over here? This is, of course, the monologue of Moses. Moses being to the Jewish people. For Moses, fear of heaven is really easy. It wasn't so hard for him at all. It was very easy. And therefore, Moses is speaking from his perspective. And he's telling the Jews, I don't get it. What's wrong with you? What, is this really so hard? Is this so hard? All God wants from you is to be fearful of heaven. For him, it was so easy. For us, indeed, it is a challenge. But for Moses, it was so easy. And he gives an example. He gives a marshal, a, a parable. It's a parable to a man who gets a knock on his door. Who's there? It's the neighbor. What does the neighbor want? A gold chalice, a gold vessel is very large. Do you have a gold bathtub? So if you have a gold bathtub, it's very easy. I have one. No big deal. If you don't have a gold bathtub, it's very hard. And then for Moses, who had fear of heaven, to him it was very easy. He had the large, very expensive gold vessel. For us, we don't have it, and therefore it is very hard. That concludes the Talmud. What does this mean? What's the lesson here? Again, we're told a lot of very central ideas of what the Torah really is there to do to us. What's it there to do to us? And we're told it's very easy. If you have it, it's very hard. If you don't have it, it's the only thing that matters. It's the end goal of Torah. What does God really want from us? This is the answer. So I have over here uh, one of the Hidden Gems of Jewish Literature. This is an anonymously written introduction to 
a, uh, an old printing of the Tomer Devora. Tomer, Tomer Devora is one of the classic books of uh, Musa and Kabbalah, written by Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. In the early part of the 20th century, it appeared with, uh, it, was a new pub, it was a new publishing, new printing of it, and it appeared with an introduction that was unsigned. However, we know who the author is. And the author is none other than the great Rabbi Nathan Svi Finkel, known to us as the altar, the elder of Slabatra. In fact, I did do two Jewish history podcasts on this great towering figure of Jewish history. One of the most significant pedagogues, visionaries, leaders of the yeshiva world in history. He opened up the yeshiva in Slabatra, which is considered the mother of all yeshivas because all the yeshivas that exist today are all either the descendants of this man or the students. Of this man. Almost all the yeshivas really stem from him. A very fascinating character. And I think in this particular introduction that he wrote anonymously, like he did everything in his life, uh, to the Tomer Devora, he outlines his philosophy on pedagogy and how to actually raise children and students that they could achieve their maximum. But he begins by trying to explain this Talmud. And briefly, what he says is as follows. He says like this, he says, we are acting in such an irrational way. All of us. We're acting in a way that even animals don't act. We, we ostensibly have so much intellect. We understand things on a logical level. We are able to learn from history. We're able to accumulate knowledge. And we, we're supposed to be smarter than animals, but that yet we, we, we behave in a way that is much more inexplicable vis-a-vis animals. How so? He says, well, any animal, they have a fear of danger. Even, he gives an example. You have an ox. The ox doesn't want to plow. Why does the ox plow all day? Because he knows. He stops plowing. He gets hit. Ox doesn't want to get hit. Ox behaves. And we know that's well, that's how animals behave. If you if they're scared, then they toe the line. But what happens with us? All of us. We live the, we live our life. And we know about God, of course, and Torah and mitzvahs, and it's really nice, it's it's really meaningful. We connect it. But how is it possible for any one of us to ever sin? Are we crazy? Don't we realize that God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, told us that how we're supposed to behave when we behave in a way that's different? We are dumber than animals. What's wrong with us? And what he explains is that there is a vast gulf separating what we know and what we really, really know. What we believe theoretically and what we believe tangibly. The word that we have, the many words we have for this, one word is called emuna, which means faith. But faith is a bad translation because faith is something kind of, that's up there, it's not, it's not concrete. In Jewish literature, the word emuna means something that you live by, it becomes as real to you as the fact, like Arnold Weinberg used to say, that you have five fingers. The fact that you know that you have a nose, the fact that you know that you have five fingers, that level of clarity that's what Amunah is. It's not saying, oh, do I believe in God? Do I not believe in God? No, that's a much lower level of faith. It's knowing that God exists, knowing that the Torah is real, is true, is binding, is immutable, the same way that you know that you have five fingers. If we actually had that, if we actually had what the Talmud calls fear of heaven, is it a big deal to start behaving in such a way? If you are walking near a river, is, do you have any temptation to jump into the water and to imperil your life? No. It's not even a hard thing at all. It's not hard. Is that a hard thing to do? No. Every sane person who wants to preserve their life doesn't jump into the raging river because that's suicidal and we're not suicidal. It's not a difficult thing. Moses looks at the Jewish people and he says to them, what does God really want from you? Just be fearful. Stay away from danger. Don't you realize that behaving in a way that's contrary to the will of God is dangerous? Avoid it. Have fear of heaven. And Moses, he has that precious gold vessel. He he made it real. 
The relationship that he had with God, with Torah, it wasn't a theoretical, some idea that's intellectually true or theoretically true. It was real. He actually had that gold vessel. To him, he's speaking and it's like, this is the easiest thing. What's God really want from you? Just avoid danger. Even animals know how to avoid danger. What's the big deal? And for us, we're like, oh my goodness, to actually live your life like God really exists? To the degree that five-finger clarity, to actually do that? That sounds so difficult. For us, you know, we're like the students of Reuel Hamazakai. To actually fear God as, as much as we fear other people, that for us is a great level of faith, of amuna, because we don't have that gold. But that's really what all of Torah is about. And this is why that's the answer to this question. What does God really want for us? What is the bottom line of Torah? Here we find the answer. The bottom line of Torah is for us to get the gold, to get the gold vessel, to make fear of heaven something that's easy, like it was easy for Moses. Because once you realize that it's not just an idea that's a really nice idea, it's really inspirational. But to realize that it's real and that it's more real than the fact that you have five fingers, it's more real than the people that you encounter, it's more real than this table, it's real. God is the only thing that's real. Everything else is God's creation. Everything else is only relatively real. God is the only thing which is an absolute. Yet, of course, we live in the world of the olam. It's obscured. It's hidden beneath the veneer, the facade of nature, of the world that we see, and and all the illusion and delusion that we're thrown into the world. But that's the goal. The goal is to take the theoretical knowledge and to translate it into reality. All of Torah is to get us to have fear of heaven. That's the only thing that's in our hands. The only thing that's in our hands is how real, how serious are we going to record to the ideas of the spiritual, to the idea of God, how real are we going to make it? That's all. That, that's it. For Moses, it was very easy because once you realize it's real, then you already behave accordingly. It's no big deal. For us, it's the gold that we're trying to shoot for. All of Torah, every mitzvah, every deed is bringing us either closer or further away from this reality. That's the first maybe way to understand this particular verse. A very powerful idea that we get from the Talmud in the Book of Baruchos, page 33. The next teaching that we have on this very interesting verse is brought to us courtesy of the Talmud in two places in the Book of Menachos on page 43. And the Talmud says, Tanya, he's taught in a brisa, which is a way of saying that's one of the teachings of the Mishnahic era. Haya Rameer Omer. Rameer was accustomed to say the following statement. Chayiv Adam Levarach Meir Brachas Bacholim. A person is obligated to make 100 blessings a day. Every day, how many blessings should you make? 100. What's the source? Our verse. Deuteronomy 10, 12. Ve'ata Yisrael, and now Israel, ma. Hashem, Hashem, what does Hashem, your God, want from you? What does the word ma mean? It sounds very close to the word me'ah, which means a hundred. That's how Rashi interprets the connection. Ma and me'ah are similar. Moses tells the Jewish people, what does God want from us? Ma? Ma, me'ah. It's hinting at the fact that we want a hundred, that we need to do a hundred blessings a day. Some of the other commentators have a different way of understanding the connection. Because again, the verse doesn't seem to mention a hundred blessings. It's it's obviously hidden in the, in, in the verse. Uh, one of the other commentators says that if you count the letters of the of the verse, there's a hundred letters in the verse. And each letter is corresponding to one of the daily blessings. Now, incidentally, I want to point out the topic of blessings, it is a central topic in, in Jewish life. But there's only one time in the Torah that we have a mitzvah that is of biblical origin to make a blessing. And that's also found in this parasha, chapter 8, verse 10, Ve'achalta, ve'savata, uve'rachta, you should eat, you should be satiated, and you should bless Hashem, your God. 
And in fact, when we have the Berkat HaMazon, which is the after meal blessing, but when you eat, you eat a meal, not just a snack, you eat a meal, you're satiated, then you make a blessing. It's also found in this week's Parsha. Now, a hundred blessings sounds like a lot. But the truth is, if you open up a Jewish prayer book, you'll notice that we have three daily prayers, four on Shabbos and festivals and holidays, five on Yom Kippur. And those prayers are replete with all kinds of blessings. And every time we say, Baruch Hashem, again, Machalam, and whatever the conclusion of that blessing is, we have one of our tally towards 100 before you eat something. All kinds of mitzvos are, are, are preceded by a blessing. You go to the bathroom, you make a blessing. You hear good news, you make a blessing. You hear bad news, you make a blessing. There's all kinds of natural phenomena, lightning, thunder, rainbows. There's a whole list. If you look at a bench, you could see all kinds of blessing that you make, which gets you pretty close to 100 even on fast days. Even on days you're not eating anything, you're still pretty close if you do all the prayers and, and you'll get close. But what's a blessing? You know, how can we understand the idea that has been suggested to us over here by Moses that when we do blessings in general or a hundred blessings every day, we are actually achieving the end goal. What does God want from us? He wants a hundred blessings. That is the essence, so to speak, of all of Torah. Now, in general, the idea of a blessing can be very easily misunderstood because God doesn't need us for anything, really. We don't believe that God needed something or, again, that's maybe a tricky theological question, but the whole idea of God needing something, that's, at least in the simple setting of Jewish philosophy, that's not something that we believe. God doesn't need anything from us. Everything we're doing is, is for our sake, for our benefit, for our good. A mitzvah is not, oh, God wants us to listen to him and that stokes his ego. We don't believe that. We say, no, it's for us. God's giving us guidance because he loves us like a child. When you offer advice to your child, it's, it's in the child's best interest because you care for them and you love them and you want the best for them. And it's important for us to banish and dispel the notion that when we are doing a blessing, it's we're doing something for God. No, it's really we're doing something for for us, but the whole concept of a blessing needs to be understood. What exactly are we achieving? What are we unlocking when we do a blessing? So I think there's probably a lot of different ways to answer that question. So for example, the Talmud book, also book of brachos, brachos means blessings after all, so it's quite natural you'll find uh, some insights to this question in the book of brachos on page 35a to b, where it turns the page. It quotes two verses in Psalms. One verse says that the earth and everything that is inside of the earth belongs to God. A second verse says that the heavens, well, they're for God. The earth, he gave to us. So again, one verse says that the earth and everything that is inside the earth is God's. And then the second verse seems to contradict that. And it says that, no, the heavens, well, that's the domain of God. The earth, that's ours. Is the earth ours, as the second verse indicates? Or is the earth God's, as the first verse indicates? So the Talmud resolves this contradiction by telling us, Kan lifnei bracha, where it says that the earth and everything that is found in the earth belongs to God. That's before, prior to the blessing. When it says that the heavens are for God and the earth is for us, that is referring to after a blessing, which, again, what it's telling us is that a blessing is a method of acquisition. Everything belongs to God, and therefore, if we're touching it, we're stealing from God. That's not a great idea. It's very hard to evade capture. You don't want to steal from God. But there's a way for us to not steal from God, by acquiring it, which I think is a very powerful idea of this of this 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 concept of the exchange of us kind of by doing the blessing and probably by absorbing the message of the blessing, God is giving us more and more and more.
with every blessing, we're unlocking more gifts from him, which is one idea. Put that on the side. My grandfather of blessed memory, he said another idea. And in fact, he said that if someone wants to get serious about their spiritual growth, the first place for them to start is by concentrating, by ruminating over the idea of blessings. That's the first place to start. Because the gravest danger of life is living mindlessly, is living is living without contemplation. It's living without meaning. When someone does not make a blessing, they don't stop. They don't think, they don't concentrate about what they're doing, then they're living a life of entitlement, a life of selfishness, a life with no relationship with God. What happens when you do a blessing? What happens when you do a hundred blessings every day? At multiple junctures of the day, you're forced to stop. You're forced to acknowledge. You're forced to Notice you're forced to appreciate everything that happens to you. Everything, you're no longer accepting things as given. You're no longer living a life of entitlement. You're living a life of appreciation, a life of gratitude, a life of awareness, of being mindful of the fact that you exist, that you live, that what you do matters. That God exists, it's opening up, it's making a small little window into our hearts. Every blessing is that opportunity. And I may add maybe that not only is it good for us spiritually, probably good for us physically as well. You know, if you have a like a wonderful, delectable, succulent steak and you don't even look at it and you don't dwell upon it and you're just watching the TV and you're eating without noticing it, you could be interviewed post facto. What was that? Was that was that macaroni and cheese? Was that a steak? You won't even notice it because you're not aware. You're not mindful. You're not living in the moment. And here, that's of course on a physical plane. And we know that the connoisseurs, they teach you that you have to pour the bottle you have to put the uh, aerators first in the, in the wine bottle. You got to swirl it around. You got to look at it. You got to put it under your tongue. And how are you supposed to drink it? I did, come on. It's somewhat. The answer is, is that you're trying to connect with what you're drinking. And it's this, but for life. You're trying to be aware, be mindful of the fact that you live and the fact that you exist and the fact that things are not necessarily the way they are. And of course, the tendency is that we take things for granted until we don't have them. And when someone, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, is not able to go to the bathroom normally, then they're like, wow, I was so ingrateful. I was so entitled. I didn't realize what I had when I was able to just relieve myself with ease. And of course, we would say, kind of from a, from a, from a, Torah perspective, is that the reason why someone may have that is because, okay, God wants you to take care. God wants you to notice. And if you're not going to notice without any intervention, you're going to notice with intervention. But it might not be the most pleasant thing. You might have to carry a pouch with you. God forbid. That's the idea. The idea of a blessing is to stop living life like an animal. And maybe that's an aggressive statement. But we could say it because it's found in it's it's found in many places in Jewish literature. The idea of man living this hybrid existence. In our body we're an animal, in our soul we're an angel, and we're this fusion. And our choice is are we going to veer towards one or are we going to veer towards the other? If we do nothing, then the answer is we'll be an animal. We'll be living robotically, we'll be living mindlessly. The Torah is encouraging us to live like an angel. How do you do that? You have to stop and pull out. You have to stop and pull out and notice the fact that you're living in the, and that God is giving you stuff and that 
not everything is self-understood and start appreciating, noticing, be more mindful, being more appreciative, having gratitude. And with every one of these blessings, you're acting like an angel and you're becoming less like an animal. You're connecting to your soul and you are connecting to God. And I want to add another very powerful and provocative idea that my grandfather quoted from his teacher. He said, we have it backwards. We think that we have to eat. But we can't just eat without a blessing, so we have to make a blessing. It's really the opposite. We have to make a blessing. And therefore, the Almighty made us that we have to eat. What this means is, and it goes broader, but this 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 concept, like the Talmud tells us, that the world is not God's place. Rather, God is the world's place. Sounds a little bit like a tongue twister. What does that mean? What does it mean that the world is not God's place? God is the world's place. So what it means is that, you know, if I ask the question, where in the world is God? What, I, what I'm assuming is, is that the world is the venue and God is inside the world. But the truth is, it's the opposite. God allows the world to exist and therefore he is not subject to the world, the world's subject to him. The world is not God's place, rather God is the world's place. What that means is, is that the, the spiritual blueprint that's not in the world. The world's in it. The world is not a place in which the spiritual can also fit in. Rather, the world is, is manipulated to fit the spiritual, not vice versa. Meaning, if we said, oh, I have to eat. Those are the rules of the world. Okay, let's add a little bit of a spiritual spice to that. Let's make a blessing. That would have it backwards. That would assume that the world is God's place. But really, it's the opposite. It's the spiritual comes first. And everything in the physical world is created in a way to fit in to the spiritual agenda that preceded it. It's a very advanced idea, but it applies here as well. That the Almighty wanted us to bless. And therefore, he made us that we need to eat. The Almighty wanted us to bless, and therefore he made it that we need to go to the bathroom. The Almighty wanted us to bless, and therefore he created the opportunities that we can bless. Just as an aside, my grandfather brought this idea, by the way, as well, for the mitzvah of honoring your parents. Again, we assume we have parents, right? You have to have parents. Oh, now you have parents. Let's add the spiritual spice. Let's do the mitzvah. Isn't it appropriate to honor your parents? Again, that ha- has it backwards. That the physical rules, so to speak, predate the spiritual rules. No, the answer is the opposite. The Almighty wants us to do the, the mitzvah of honoring our parents, having fear of our parents. And therefore, he arranged, he created that we don't spontaneously just come into existence without parents. It could have been done any way that he chose. Rather, in order to fulfill the mitzvah, the world was created as such that we have parents. What we're telling us here, what the idea that we're, we're being told over here, is that the reason why we digest, it's because we can notice it, appreciate it, connect to God, give a blessing. The reason why we even need to eat it's because we could stop, we could acknowledge it. We could say, Baruch HaTashem HaKinu Melech HaOlam. We could acknowledge God's sovereignty and dominion over the world. We could come face to face with the only reality that really exists, the dominion of God, for a human to be able to break through the smoke and mirrors, the deception, the delusion, the illusion of the world. That's why God created the world. And that is manifested by a blessing. And maybe we can even say 
that for us to maybe get that experience, we need a hundred blessings a day. Because again, we're so submerged and immersed in the illusion that we we're living like this virtual reality. We have these goggles on that we don't even see the real world. God again is hidden. He sees, but is unseen. And we have to batter this idea again and again, a hundred times a day, maybe once. We'll take a notice. 36,000 times a year. Maybe we'll actually take some something home. We'll actually take the lesson home. We'll actually stop and make a blessing once and acknowledge the powerful and mind-changing insight that is found in every single one of those 36,000 blessings. That's all that God wants from us. That's the whole purpose of the world. To have this encounter with God that we find in blessings, that is the goal. And Moses conveys this to the people. What does God want from you? A hundred blessings? Take the lesson of the blessings home. I want to conclude with another idea of how to maybe understand this verse. Again, the verse said to us, Moses ostensibly is going to give us the bottom line. What does God really, what does he actually want from us? And it lists four different things. To fear God. To go in God's ways. To love God. And to worship God with all our hearts and with all our soul. Maybe we can suggest that what this is telling us is that, of course, all of Torah, that's all still true, right? That's all still the will of God. You say the Torah is the will of God. And that's not found in this verse necessarily. This is one verse out of thousands, 5,845 to be precise. So there's a lot of verses and all that is the will of God. So what is special about this? Maybe we can suggest that beyond 613, beyond the idea of someone saying, yes, I want to do what God tells me is the best for me. I want to do the Torah. I want to do the Shabbos. I want to do the Tefillin. I want the Mezuzah. I want it all. 613. God says, what does God really want from you? Maybe the idea is that our relationship to God, our relationship to, to, to Torah should not be generic, should not be cookie cutter. We should try to find a way to make our pursuit of greatness something individualized, something special. It means, of course, there's a session of 13 mythos and there are no carve outs that say, well, this is not my style, this is not my type, I'm not in the mood. It doesn't say that anywhere. You're an adult. The Almighty believes in you. The Almighty believes that you could do it. Okay, says Moses, but don't take the mistaken approach of saying the Almighty wants you to be a robot. The Almighty wants you to just obey and not to have your own personal connection. He gives us these four ideas. Love of God, fear of God. Those two are almost opposites, but they're both relationships with God. Go into God's ways. That is, of course, a relationship with God. It's also a relationship with other people. Worshiping God with all our hearts, with all, with all our soul. These are different dimensions of general spiritual archetypes or character types. And what it's telling us is that we should try to find our own spiritual niche beyond what we're, what's obligatory to all. What's what's my area? What is the role that I need to play? What is my mission? Where do I need to make my own mark on the uh, on the world and on myself? And this is maybe we could say this is yes, it's interesting. These all these things are actually mitzvahs in the Torah. But they're they're general character types. And we see this uh, for example in all the great giants of our history, even going back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We look at them as, you know, the, the, the paragons of, of spiritual greatness. Yet we know that they were very different. Abraham was all kindness. And Isaac, his son, is almost the exact opposite. He's all judgment. 
And the obvious question is, I don't get it. Which way are you supposed to do? Which way does the Torah tell us? Are you supposed to be like Abraham? Are you supposed to be like Isaac? Was Abraham imperfect? Was Isaac imperfect? We say no. We say that both of them were perfect. Well, how could it be that they're both perf- perfect and they're both, and they're both almost opposites? The answer is like this. Both of them, and by the way, the Talmud attests to this. The Talmud book of Avodah Zarah, page 14. The Talmud attests to the fact that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all of them obeyed all of Torah. In fact, prophetically, or maybe some other way, all of them obeyed not only all 613 mitzvos, even the rabbinic laws, says the Talmud. So they all did 613, so how'd they end up being different? The answer is, is that each one of them was different. They had different character types. They had different proclivities. They had different uh, drives. They, they're, a human is not, it's not a robot. And certain humans excel in certain areas and are, are drawn to certain areas and have to build their spiritual world with a certain flavor, with a certain style. Abraham was more about being gregarious, being loving, being overflowing with goodness, with giving to everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. It could be pagans, doesn't matter. If you walked into, a, into Isaac's circle and you were a pagan, he'd smack you up. He'd chew you up. Is he any worse than Abram? No. He was more of a you know secluded, consolidator, an internal person. Again, this is probably sacrilegious to say, but it seems like that Abraham is more of the extrovert and Isaac is more of the introvert. And of course, Jacob is this hybrid. That's what Jacob's considered the, the greatest of them all. He's able to play on both fields. But the point is, is that Your spiritual identity, your spiritual persona is more than just, did I check the boxes? What it's telling us here is that there's different ways for us to direct, to focus our spiritual energy. And here we see four of them. What does God want from you? What does he want from you? You, yes, of course, everyone, all of us, we have our obligations that are uniform. But we have to find a way to create who we, we are and what we spiritually stand for beyond the 613 and we're given four options. We have the people that are drawn to love. Maybe that's the more the Abrahamic type. We have people that are more drawn to fear. We have the worshiping God with all our hearts, with, with all our soul. And we have walking in the ways of God. All of them, of course, are mitzvahs on the own, their own right, but they're also personality types, but not personality types, but maybe personality types that are channeled to create a certain spiritual identity. It's another idea that, of course, is a comprehensive theme that can, fo- can fit into this, into, into this verse. And we have, I think, three very powerful ideas uh, that are shared to us by the sources, by the Talmud and by the commentators. Uh, the first one, like we said, was the idea that what God really wants from us is, f- is fear of heaven. That's really the only thing that we have. And it's really, really easy if you have it. And it's really, really, really hard to get it. And everything that we're trying to do is striving to get that. And once we get it, once it becomes real, it's very easy to to actually behave and abide by the dicta of, of fear of heaven. The second idea that we saw is the idea of 100 blessings. And it's the, the, the spiritual transformation that is inherent in the concept of even a single blessing of how it is a paradigm shift in how we live our life. And finally, we saw a third very powerful idea, and that is that beyond what is obligatory to all, we each need to find our own identity, our own carve-out, like Abram, like Isaac, like Jacob, like the Gona Vilna, very different characteristic than the other great leader of the 18th century, the Baal Shem Tov, very different. Well, which one was greater? Each one of them identified their mission, their unique mission that God made for them and their unique way of connecting to God. And they pursued it and they did not follow a cookie cutter generic approach to greatness. They pursued greatness on their own way in one of these four areas. Very powerful. Three different approaches to understand this very intriguing and very powerful verse. What does God want from us? What does he really, really want from us? He wants us to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, 
and to worship him with all our heart and with all our soul. My email address is rabbiwolvegmail.com. You can send me an email if you have any questions, any comments, or if you just want to say hi. And thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.